another episode of the Old Scout Celtic Podcast. Fauchagu Ye Old Scots, the Celtic Podcast. Kimraha Huladunya, how is everyone? On today's show in Fekimich Beck and Gaelic, that's Let's Try Little Gaelic. Frustrated with Gaelic? In Celtic history, we're going to talk about Summerland. And in everyday Celtic ways, it's the ghost of Glencoe. And we're going to hear music from Granny Halland, Little Fire, Kathleen McInnes, Mary Plowboys, and Monrin. And as always, it's a wee bit of Irish trivia to test your knowledge to start us off. As a young boy, what was Cahulan's name? All right. Check out the E.L. Scott Facebook group where you can be a part of the Celtic culture. And keep an eye out for all the different videos our YouTube channel and Facebook group have to offer. Karish Maha, let's kick this thing off. Welcome to Learn a Gaelic Song. Today's song is Orn Donald Fatrick Egan, Song of Donald Peter John. Now this is another Gaelic song from Kathleen McInnes. Now this one is another lament song for the sudden passing of a man named Donald Peter. The song was composed by the bard Michael Rua McPherson of uh, Tov Achulis, South Uist. Now this song speaks to the uh, soul of anyone who has lost a loved one suddenly. It takes the full scope of one's consciousness when hearing this dreadful news. Alright, it's kind of a sad song, but it's still beautiful. Remember, Gaelic's at the top, English at the bottom. Get ready. Spoken a gushing so glush me catan. Do fatric moroya, hook for nele pas. Co I give a tulish, so hasun tucks hoslan. Harushing a smunching can be a hook ya. Gakupenagus pastion siatranic sakui. Scorch of Ulaun a huadiat, Sagualaun angadi. Hatok feel no oran, Umbron ring angli. Sketavirgat misk oikri, Picar solas kanji. He sing trahug as liana, he sing erting spray. He sing yaller as crians railed on a liana gna spear. Ach, I'm like shink a shiri, koshak fiar al no hen. Quiem foshle, ach, the astis be a markier al Smaha fisse kach na pi kavil sargun kanji. Stuvar yet nach san maja se piarching viling. Ach yashin ha hel pasga kongishka san ko. Von lenovik ha edva kal karukart ruit kru. Gartulich, 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 shalli. Anjil vi gat chara, and halen sanu. Shing a feich king te fastjen, spent a graisi at the kui. Bion gaina, gabrach gaif sangri alan gait agu.
Israel Vicar Hanlach Gesching the Avu Can Yavor Slekad Valkad and the Fuskilch Miskandloy Anskach Gesantanik and Wal Hulia Hook Vuan Scottish Gaelic is native to the Gales of Scotland. Scottish Gaelic developed out of the Old Irish, and learning this beautiful language can be a direct link to your Gaelic ancestors. Follow along in Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, and like I said, let's try a little Gaelic. Frustrated with Gaelic? An easy way to keep the Scottish Gaelic language alive is to keep it in your daily vocabulary. Little bits here and there to let those around you know how important it is to you. This is especially important if you have small children. They will have the benefits of learning another language and share a common link with you and your heritage. One to ten in Gaelic. Un, one. Ya, two, three, three. Keher, four. Kowik, five. Shia, six. Shak, seven. Ok, eight. Noi, nine. And Jack, ten. Numbers 11 through 20 in Gaelic. Un jig, da jig, tri jig, keher jig, koik jig, shia jig, shak jig, ok jig, noi jig, and fikant. Other numbers in Gaelic. Jack er ikit thirty Da ikit forty Da ikit sa jack fifty Also Blehiet half a hundred Tree fikit sixty Kiet one hundred and Mila one thousand Ordinal numbers in Gallic Hiet first Darna second Trace, third. Kethra, fourth. Koikiv, fifth. Shietiv, sixth. Shakiv, seventh. Akiv, eighth. Noyev, ninth. And Jekiv, tenth. Far back a castralic a shaman a hal na shade on a grain ya gala tu hre ya chai ha chai shak din a gala di ya na gas na te chun yeller ban inji yeller. Tal ha chai tal ha chai sta me wa hel diga hu te salen ya hu te salen ya don a na gain ya gas don a na glen ya gas don a na grain ya don a na grain ya. Nilian van a corky na du le shag gaman na kalini o gas shingle is pa samrei kusamali le shel an a shak din a blader is prega akdri skelte. 
Torre de torre está meu a relíquia, ruta salênia, ruta salênia, tu não na grenha, que estou na glênia, que estou na grenha, tu não na grenha. Esta alha de escura, de sprinter maior, de tu não na grenha, com a gente ver sabor, de caslapi, a yanica tapi, espeche branha, de te crack na guerra. Torre de torre está meu a relíquia, ruta salênia, ruta salênia, tu não na grenha, que estou na glênia, que estou na grenha, tu não na grenha. On a vada liam rahas pa vrabo lia wata in am shirin egin skar sal ha jekid fara ha wul da are la lui la wada la halaster train war na hercules gregach Tol ha che tel ha che sta me wa hel nega huta salenia huta salenia tu no na genya kas tu no na glenya kas tu no na grenya tu no na grenya Ta tu no lar mishke sa fani college kas na liania beki na liania beki ta tu no lar mishke sa fani college kas na pashia beki na pashia beki Tol ha chee tel ha chee sta me wa hel nega huta salenia huta salenia tu no na genya kas tu no na glenya kas tu no na grenya tu no na grenya Far tak ik is vrouw die kies om en haar haalde zee toen dan naar Green. Ja, kolde tuig reed, ja, ga je het zee zakken en kolde die dan. Ik is natte tuneler, van nu zie je heller. Toen het zee, toen het zee staat me wel heel lekker. Goed te salen, ja, goed te salen. Toen dan naar Green, je kies toen dan naar Green, je kies toen dan naar Green, je toen dan naar Green, je. Nielin van een korkie naar Roelis, je komt naar Kalini ook. Een single is pas aan Rekus, aan Mali, de zee dan een zak en een blader is breken. Haak drie schild, dat al het zee, dat al het zee staat me wel heel lekker. Goed te salen, ja, goed te salen. Toen dan naar Green, je kies toen dan naar Green, je kies toen dan naar Green, je toen dan naar Green. Ta tu no lar mishke sa fani college kis na lania beki na lania beki ta tu no lar mishke sa fani college kis na pashia beki na pashia beki to hachi to hachi sa me wa hel nega kute salenia kute salenia tu no na grenia kis tu no na grenia kis tu no na grenia tu no na grenia. Woo! Celtic history brings you the tales of the land, castles, warriors, heroes, legends, and customs that have created the rich, vibrant, and sometimes strange and wonderful history of the Celtic world. This week's Celtic Badass, well, it's summer, man. I've been saving this one for just special occasions. The rise of a superb badass, a badass that forged his path to badassery through conquest, bold courage, and ingenuity. Summerled's early life was gloomy, though. His family was in crisis, along with his family's fortune. His grandfather, Giladamon, had been driven from his lands by in Argyle by the Norse, probably King uh, King Harold Fairhair sought refuge in County Fermanagh in uh, Ireland with his kindred of Clan Cola. Summerled's father, Gillibride, had some unsuccessful attempts to remove the Norse invaders from lands in Morvern and um, Ardgar and Argyle, but the Norse had a stranglehold on the entire west coast of Scotland, from Man all the way to the Orkneys. Now Gillibride and his warriors were forced to hide in caves and woods of Morvern and carry out guerrilla attacks on their enemies in an attempt to drive them from their lands. They did this for so long that they became known as the Gillibride Nahum, uh, Gillibride of the Cave. Now, they seemed to be at their lowest point as a family, sparsing out in existence in the shadows of an invading force. The Norse were poised to drive the pesty islemen out of the isles in Argyle and completely destroy their chances of ever recovering their former lives. Now it was at this point that Gillibride's son, Summerlin, a bold and courageous person with brilliant strategic and tactical abilities, took control of their destiny and their attempts to regain the family possessions. And he did that, and then some. This badass would become known as Rex Insularium, King of the Isles. Now, with his father's spirit broken, few supporters, and seemingly entrenched Norse enemy, Summerled has a daunting task before him. And Summerled's family name did not hold the same sway it did at one time, humiliated by the downfall at the hands of the Norse. Now, during this time, the Norse used their longships to attack the last vestiges of clan rule uh, in the Isles and in Argyle and in a last-ditch move to secure total domination over western parts of Scotland. 
and but in some months past, he had impressed the chief of Clan McKinnis of Morver. He had distinguished himself in battle and impressed the chief who would die from his wounds in that very same battle. Uh, Summerled had gained the moniker Summer, Summerled Mor Mahilabra. Summerled the Mighty, son of Gilabra. Now, according to legend, an aged chief of, who followed them when he passed away of Clan McKinnis recommended Summerled as their new leader based on this reputation. So with his known prowess in battle and the chief's approval, it was unanimously decided that he was asked to command. Now when Summerlet took command of the Clan McInnes, he knew that they were outnumbered. But this is the moment when badasses are made, and his brilliant strategy was to make the Norse believe that they had more men than they actually did. Summerlet ordered his men to kill a herd of cattle and skin them. Then he ordered this little group to march around the hilltop in view of the Norse who were camped nearby. Now first they marched by in their own clothes. Then they would circle around unbeknownst to the Norse and circle back across the hilltop dressed in the cowhide, hair side out. Then circling back around one more time, they marched through with hide skins out. Now this maneuver made their force look three times as big as it and it really was, and as the Norse intelligence knew, which began instilling doubt and fear in the hearts of those posed against Summerlin. Now, twice as many campfires were built that night, and twice as many that were needed, and each man took their hides and placed them over uh, near the fires, propped up with sticks, so it looked like there was more men there than actually was. And then they had a good meal partied and had a good time for the upcoming battle. This made the Norse realize that there was no fear in their hearts, even though they were just putting on an act. Then Summerlin attacked the now demoralized Norse warriors, who had lost some of its force to desertion in the night, and its will to fight a larger army. Summerlin's forces drove them northwards to the River Steel, where they were hunted down and killed. Some did escape, though, this may have been a ploy of Summerlet's all along. Word of Summerlet's leadership, bravery, and cunning in battle, it spread like wildfire. And it seems that Summerlet had made a name for himself. He had become the focus for the resistance movement against the Norse in the West. His success renewed the spirit of the dispossessed Gaels, who would flock to him from all the lands. Now, further successes bred confidence that Summerlin was the right leader at the right time to drive the Norse from Scotland. Summerlin didn't sit back on his laurels. He pressed his advantage and continued his attack uh, on the Norsemen and their strongholds. He never let up or allowed them to make advances or alliances or regroup. Men from all over rallied to his cause, and his numbers grew. This allowed him to drive the Norsemen out of Argyle and back to their bases in the Western Isles of the Hebrides. This was the most badass event to happen because Summerlin had successfully challenged the Norse and now their presence in the Isles was in question. Would he try to drive them out of there too? Who knows? Now many people view Summerlin as a great Gallic hero who rose up against his Norse oppressors, when in fact it was more like a Norse civil war. You see, ever since the first landing at Lindisfarne in 794 AD, the Norse had continually returned and eventually stayed within the British Isles, especially the islands along the western coast of Scotland. And then over the next few hundred years, the Scottish clans became increasingly more of a norse gale hybrid. What we know of as Scotland today was really a group of different kingdoms in 1153 AD. Norse, Gallic, Gal Gale, and remnants of the Cumbrians. All of Scotland had been fighting the Norse for generations, and the last thing they needed was another Norse overlord. The Summerlet knew this. This was where his brilliance came in. So Summerlet embraced the Gallic culture and that side of his ancestry, and in doing so he brought even more people into his fold. 
The people who managed his forces, ships, and castles were foremost remnants of his father's Fermanagh and Morvern warriors. But increasingly they came from Ardgar, Lorne, Appen, Napdale, Kintyre, and of course all parts of Argot. You see, Summerlin wasn't just a ruthless warlord who took lands. He was a ruthless warlord that recaptured his ancestral lands by right. Upon being made chief, he took the rest by might, and right and might make a formidable combination. Summerlin concentrated on the Western Isles because the seas were the highways of the time, and their complicated geography he could use to his advantage. If he gained total control of the West, then he could expand his influence and lands to the East. After all, the Scots King, King David I, was too busy Normanizing the South and Northumbria to worry about losing what all Scotland except him thought of as the heart of Scotland, its birth with the kings of Argyll and Dalraina. Now Summerled forged his kingdom with a Norse hammer, and this gained him the moniker Hammer of the Norse, cementing his leadership with the people. Now, I could write a thick-ass novel and still not thoroughly explain the badassery of this great warrior. He did way too much, and his influence can still see, be seen today. I mean, his sons, Donald Mac Ragnall, would head some of the largest and most powerful clans in all of Scotland. Now, among them, McDougal's, McDonald's, the clan Ranald, and many more. He even innovated the use of a central rudder instead of what had been used up to that point, a steerboard. He did this so that he could have smaller ships built that were more maneuverable and of course deadlier. But the story of Summerlid that I like best that perfectly describes his badass ingenuity is the story where Summerlid wanted to marry Ragnar, daughter of Olaf the Red, the Norse King of Man whose territory included the Hebrides. However, this warlord was having none of it. What King Olaf wanted from Summerled was not a son-in-law, but assistance in raiding the Isle of Skye, a troublesome little island in the inner Hebrides. Summerled, being of a bloodthirsty disposition, consented to help, but had ulterior motives. Summerled knew that helping him get control would extend his own influence, but marrying King Olaf's daughter would give him influence and grow his lands and put him in a position to control all of the Western Isles and Argyle. Now one of Summerled's kinsmen helped him hatch a plan under cover of darkness. This man of his crept into Olaf's camp and drilled holes in Olaf's personal ship right at the waterline, which he then plugged with tallow, which is beef fat. The next day, when they were off to raid Sky, Olaf's boat started to spring leaks, when all of the tallow got washed away. He cried out to Summerled for help, but his words fell on deaf ears. Summerled sailed just close enough, but would not help until Olaf consented to Summerled's proposal of marriage to his daughter Ragnar. What could he do? So, he gave consent. Then Summerled had his man jump on board to plug the holes with perfectly made plugs, almost like they were made to be there. Now Summerled was so happy with how the plot turned out that he rewarded him with lands. And this was the start of the land of McIntyres that are still there to this day. Now Summerled, he was slain in 1164 at the Battle of Renfrew amidst an invasion of mainland Scotland, commanding forces drawn from all over his kingdom. The reasons for this attack may have been to nullify Scottish encroachment, but the scale of his venture suggests that he had greater ambitions. He commanded a large force and victory should have been easily won. However, Summerled fell early in the battle and his forces were shattered by the loss of their leader. They did not recover and they lost the battle. In the wake of Summerled's demise, his once vast sea kingdom fragmented as various would-be successors vied for dominance. Now his legacy lived on with the Lordship of the Isles, a power base that his clans would use to dominate for centuries to come.
traditions and customs that have created a unique and personal culture that still affects those that are Celtic and those that just love the Celtic world. The 
Ghost of Glencoe. Murder, massacre, betrayal, and treason. Glencoe is one of the most spectacular areas of unspoiled wilderness in Scotland. There is a haunting quality about the moor-clad mountains that stand as sentinels over the eight-mile-long glen which runs from east to west along the northern border of Argyll. And there are those who say that the glen is haunted, for this is the glen of weeping, the site of one of the greatest atrocities in Scottish history. Even at the best of times, Scotland has a grim and dark history. Murder has always been considered the foulest of crimes in Scots law. But in the Highlands, with its strict code of hospitality, there is a more heinous crime. It is called murder under trust. That is why the massacre of Glencoe has reverberated so strong throughout the ages. Those MacDonalds had taken in the regiment of British soldiers, most, mostly Clan Campbell, and given them shelter, food, and friendship. And this is why the spirits of the slain MacDonald clansmen are said to return to the Glen of Weeping from time to time, but especially every year on the anniversary of that fateful day, the 13th of February, 1692. Now winter is the time to visit Glencoe in its ghostly grandeur. The low-lying sun makes the mountains appear in their starkest and most forbidding. Shifting mists create an eerie, otherworldly quality to the landscape. However, early in the morning of that 13th of February, the anniversary of the massacre, the melancholy presence of the murdered McDonald's is felt most keenly. On this day, people have claimed to have glimpsed ghostly shadows of the fugitive clansmen crouching among the crags. Some have even claimed to see the massacre reenacted or to have heard the plaintive cries of those who perished. One unlucky distant relative of John Dalrymple, who had taken shelter in a carriage that had broken a wheel in the middle of the glen on its way to Fort William, is said that in the darkest of the night he could hear wails in the distance, and he was tormented by the ghost of those slain, killed because of the order sent by his distant relative all those years ago. That frightful night haunted the man, eventually driving him insane before taking his own life by hanging. The wailing is eerily reminiscent, and it is said that the atrocity could have been even more extensive were it not that the Koenig of the McDonald's was heard wailing on the eve of the Glencoe Massacre. Hearing her cries, some of the clan members took warning and fled into the mountains. In Celtic mythology, the, the Koenig is invisible to the human eye. Her presence is revealed by her heart-stopping wails. She will be heard crying at a waterfall in the night before calamity overtakes her clan. Now, for 300 years, the, the Nine of Diamonds, which is kind of an odd thing to talk about, but the Nine of Diamonds is a deck of, in a deck of playing cards has been known as the Curse of Scotland. A number of stories have been proposed to account for this, but perhaps the most persuasive is that the family crest of the Dalrymples of Stair contains nine diamonds. The Englishman responsible for the orders to massacre the McDonald's was named John Dalrymple, Master of Stair. Stair's last political action, though, was in the debate over Article 22 of the Act of Union concerning Scottish representation in the Unified Parliament. Article 22 provided for Scotland to be represented in the new Parliament of Great Britain by 16 of its peers and 45 members of the House of Commons. It provided for Scotland's peers to have the same rights as English peers in any trial of peers. Many believe that this is a half-hearted effort on his behalf to make some sort of amends for what he know he done. The uh, guilt was just too much for him. And since he never really received any punishment for his atrocities, it is also said that by numerous servants of his that a mysterious wailing could be heard for two nights after the 7th of January 1707 when the approval of the Act of Union was made. And he was found dead just two days later in his lodgings, allegedly of apoplexy. Hi.
something I feel something That I cannot forget I feel something Deep within Just feel no regret check out my youtube channel it's got celtic music podcasts gallic language gallic song celtic history videos plus lots more and my facebook group where you can give me your inputs and insights on all things celtic but before i let you go the trivia question answer satanta martian leave and drasda bye for now but i'm gonna let you go with a song
When I was a young man, I carried my pack And I lived the free life of the rover From the Murray's Green Basin to the dusty outback And I waltzed my Matilda all over Then in 1915 the country said, son, it's time to stop rambling, there's work to be done. So they gave me a tin hat, they gave me a gun, and they sent me away to the war. And the band played waltzing Matilda, as our ship Pulled away from the key That midst all the cheers Flag waving and tears We sailed off to Gallipoli How well I remember That terrible day when the blood stained the sand and sea water And how in that hell they call Suvla Bay We were butchered like lambs at the slaughter Johnny Turk, he was ready, he primed himself well He rained us with bullets then he chased us with shell And in twelve minutes flat We were all blown to hell He nearly blew us straight back to Australia And the band played waltzing Matilda As we stopped to bury our slain Buried ours, and the Turks buried theirs Then we started all over again Now those that were left, we just tried to survive In a mad world of blood, death and fire and for ten weary weeks I kept myself alive While around me the corpses piled higher Then a big Turkish shell knocked me arse overhead And when I awoke in my hospital bed When I saw what it had done how I wished I was dead I never knew there were worse things than dying For no more I'll go waltzing Matilda All around the green bush far and near For to hump tent and pegs Sure a man needs both legs no more waltzing Matilda for me They collected the wounded, the crippled and the maimed And they shipped us back home to Australia The legless, the armless, the blind, the insane those poor wounded heroes from Suvla And as our ship pulled into Circular Quay I looked at the place where my legs used to be And thanked Christ there was no one there waiting for me To grieve or to mourn or to pity and the band played waltzing Matilda As they carried us down 
的岗位。They just stood there and stared. Then they turned all their faces away. So now, every April, I sit on my porch and I watch the parade pass before me. And I see my old comrades how proudly they march, renewing those dreams of past glory. And I see the old men all bent stiff and sore, the tired old heroes from a forgotten war, and the young people who ask. What are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band plays waltzing Matilda, and the old men still answer the call. But year after year, their numbers get fewer. Someday no one will march there at all. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda, who come a waltzing Matilda with me? And their ghosts may be heard as they pass by the billabong. Come a waltzing Matilda with me.